Hello, this is Pat Hindle, editor at Microwave Journal. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar in the RF and Microwave Training Series. Today's topic is Innovative Passives and Substrates Enable RF Power Amplifier Designs for Cooking Applications, connected by a team uh, consisting of Anarin, Uber & Schooner, the RF Energy Alliance, and Rogers Corporation. This webinar will last about an hour with the first 45 minutes for a presentation. The rest of the hour will be spent answering your questions. You may submit a question at any time during the presentation. Just use the Q&A box on the website to do this, and please leave the default setting to all panelists. In this webinar, we're going to cover the RF Energy Alliance with an introduction and brief roadmap toward solid-state microwave ovens. Then that will be followed by a presentation from Rogers Corporation discussing RF PCB material considerations for high power applications. Next, Anarin will cover power amplifier matching and coupler design using single and multi layer PCB technology. And finally, we will have Hoover and Schooner who will cover connecting power amplifiers with cooking cavities and the innovative steps that are needed for that. Now at this point, I will hand the presentation over to Dr. Klaus Warner from the RF Energy Alliance. Thank you very much, Sir Patrick, for the kind introduction. My name is Klaus Warner. I'm the Executive Director of the RF Energy Alliance. In today's webinar, I hope that you will hear and hopefully also learn a lot about what the causes of the, uh, and the organization, the RF Energy Alliance, are but most noteworthy also what kind of critical technology uh, is out there and will be necessary to enable and to build for future power amplifier um, designs in order to enable cooking applications. And we say cooking applications, we mean consumer applications. The, so we will start with a bit of uh, an introduction to the Alliance and to solid state uh, RF, actually, RF Energy. And Rogers, Anara, and who wants to know will follow, and we will have some concluding remarks in the end. So, what is it all about, solid state RF Energy? Basically, it's just making use of the controlled electromagnetic radiation in terms of heating items and power processes. And the processes can be a lot of different things. It can be Lamps, for example, it could be automotive ignition, but it can also be something more or less trivial like heating or drying. And basically, we all know about this because we're using our magnetron at home, which is doing, which is heating things for us, our food in particular, uh, unless you put cats in there or other stuff. Um, and why does it matter? We believe that, uh, and we are convinced actually and know about that, so that solid state of energy is as such a highly efficient, very controllable, selective, and clean energy source. And I will give more detail about that going further. This picture actually describes a generic, generic use of uh, or generic application in solid state uh, RF energy. In this case, we have a cavity here. Um, maybe more or less like the mag magnetron cavity that you know from home or mag microwave cavity that you know from home. And we are creating RF energy here by means of an RF synthesizer and an RF power amplifier. This now is all solid state, so semiconductor based. Your microwave at home is most likely driven by a magnetron, which is an old, 60 years old, uh, very well and very well engineered out tube technology to create 2.45 gigahertz electromagnetic radiation at about 1.2 kilowatts, roughly, output power. So we're trying to do the same thing, but now with uh, solid state. That means that we have a, the most important thing that I will always uh, uh, say, if you ask me what solid state of energy is all about, I answer the most important thing is control. Because here with the synthesizer, and uh, phase control that you can build in. You have all the ingredients uh, in your hand and control about power level, frequency within the band that you are allowed to use, uh, phase settings, and you can be very fast in handling that kind of RF and change it. 
last but not least, very importantly, we also have a closed loop here so we know exactly what kind of power we are irradiating into the process, but also the amount of power that comes back. And that is an important notion uh, in solid state RF energy because uh, most of the processes actually are not such a perfect matched load, and you are getting some power back. That also uh, gives some uh, uh, boundary conditions to the technologies that we will discuss later on, but high RISVA and, and then a certain amount of energy will always come back into your PIA, and you need to manage that. But other than that, the closed loop control, of course, also gives you the chance to quickly react to anything that actually happens within your process. And that is something that the magnetron, amongst other things, cannot do. So this is control that we can master going forward. So again, in order to summarize really the benefits, you have the unprecedented process control with solid state RF. Um, that gives you fast uh, re feedback and fast reaction to uh, changing in your processes, changes in your processes, typically in the microsecond realm, you have excellent reproducibility, and you can tune your processes in terms of very low reflected power, and, and hence make sure that you, the energy that you have at your disposal is delivered efficiently. The power amplifiers as such can typically be small in terms of form factor. You have a flexibility in the hardware partitioning. It's a solid state semiconductor based reliability. That means if you treat the semiconductor as well, they basically last forever, unless, and much unlike the magnetron, which is typically about to fail after something like 5,000 hours, it depends a bit, and also the semiconductors will typically not be a single point of failure like the magnetron in that sense. It's also low voltage electronics, which is nice for maintenance folks, and it is supported by electronics cost base. So. I'm pointing to this um, with the background of the fact that currently things are pretty expensive, but given the fact that we are in the electronics industry, we have shown that we worked wonders a couple of times before, and everybody knows about things like LCD, for example, TV players, cameras, digital cameras, all mobile phones, and things like that that can become pretty cheap if we just get the volume and our minds around that. To give you a little bit of flavor of what kind of uh, applications we are talking about and market opportunities we're actually talking about, then uh, you may want to turn to the left uh, column here, which is basically cooking, drying, and industrial processes. Uh, there's, for example, more than 70 million microwave ovens for consumer use in every, uh, every year. There is a lot of light out there that we can support. Currently, uh, applications like medical uh, ablation or something like that. Medical applications are not so high volume, but again, there's some potential also in the automotive market in ignition and lighting, um, but driven by the fact that there's more than 80 million cars being built every year as well. So all these markets are extremely uh, nice, extremely large. The only problem is the technology currently is too expensive for mass market adoption. And that's exactly where the energy, uh, the RF Energy Alliance comes in. Uh, we have this, uh, con we are a club of like-minded companies that want to make sure that the technology that we are talking about, solid state RF energy, and the power amplifiers associated with that, will make inroads into consumer electronics volumes. So we need to reduce system costs. We need to minimize design complexity. We need to ease the application integration and hence make sure that uh, we can increase the market adoption and the growth of that technology. And we'll hear more about critical ingredients of that technology as we go on with the other companies on the phone. Just to give you a notion of what kind of members are with us currently, I believe we are on the order of 74 members. There's three classes that I'm not going to dwell on, but uh, you should note that there's members from all over the supply chain that actually build a power amplifier, solid state power amplifier, up to the users, uh, like uh, in this case, the Neelers, ETOs, ITWs, Whirlpools, Panasonic's of this world. So, white good centric currently. What 
do we do? We work with our members to, for instance, uh, look into standardizations, and to that extent we have come up with a number of papers and documents that are open for our members and accessible to the members in first place, like an RSDA roadmap for industrial applications that is due and for this year, system integration guidelines um, that you need to be aware of. We already issued a roadmap for residential applications and there will be more out there as we go forward until the next year. So if you're interested to join, I invite you to visit our website and maybe there's a bit room for more questions later on. So with that, I would like to hand over um, the and, and instant um, invite art as we are from Rogers uh, Corporation to go on with critical technology inside the PA. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, thank you, Klaus. Uh, this is uh, Art of Wild from uh, Rogers Corporation. I'm Key Business Development Manager, uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, the area of uh, uh, high performance materials, uh, in essence, uh, why Rogers is a member of this and benefits uh, of the organization and the materials. So Rogers uh, has basically a, a proud history of, uh, of um, history of the future engineering materials and helping uh, power, protect, and connect our world um, by addressing the challenges of growing megatrends. Uh, we're founded in 1832, and Rogers has a history of material innovation of the past two decades and expanded uh, worldwide markets. Uh, so what is a technical strategic business to talk a little bit about uh, who we are first, uh, the advanced and safe solution team, uh, we provide a broad portfolio of this language and using print capabilities for high frequency, high speed, transfer of data, communications, uh, everything now, and video content worldwide. Uh, we also have two other groups uh, in addition to uh, the advanced connectivity solutions, the Latin American material solutions, providing reliable cushioning, sailing, impact protection, and energy management solutions critical to product performance, and a group of power electronic solutions which provide innovative substrates, bus bars, and microchannel coolers uh, for mo power modules, semiconductors, and systems. Uh, Rogers' revenue in 2015 was $641 million. The company has approximately 2,800 employees around the globe with manufacturing in three continents, and sales are distributed mainly in Asia and then the other 50% in North America and in Europe. Historically, the RF markets for PCB materials have been aerospace and defense, and it continues to drive much of that innovation today as well, which uh, later we'll see uh, that have been adopted into commercial world. Cellular communications and automotive radar sensors are a prime example of that technology coming from uh, the defense industry. Today, mobile communication infrastructure is the largest market for high-frequency materials. Uh, growing strong are the markets for automotive, digital, and an emerging market for mobile internet devices are also important to Rogers, and particularly the emerging 5G market. But the market we're talking about today is the use of RF energy, not for communications, but for the transfer of energy, and in particular, in this case, solid-state RF cooking. Uh, Rogers sees many similarities between uh, this and the hard disk market being replaced with solid-state drives, and we believe that this application will bring new opportunities for high performance materials. So let's talk a little bit now about what it is that Rogers has to offer in solutions for this market and this application. Uh, often we are asked how hot materials uh, can be operating at, and the answer is never that simple with the temperature. It usually uh, involves some more complexity. From PCB fabrication perspective, these materials can be handled uh, uh, less be soldering temperatures, uh, while in function we recommend continuous operations be below 180 C. Uh, many times UL requirements for maximum up, MOT, maximum operating temperature, is usually in the range of 115 to 135, depending on the material grades, thicknesses, and the trace width, uh, the, the transmission lines. So in that sense, you know, we have to kind of talk more one-on-one -on, -one on the specifics here. But what we have here is an example, a model example, uh, which we will show data on the next slide, of what happens uh, at uh, high temperatures. And in, in this case, where we model a, uh, an amplifier, we model the transmission line carrying RF energy 
at 250 watts at 2.5 gigahertz, something similar to what we are trying to solve in, as part of the RF Energy Alliance. So the, uh, what we have is included the RC door to feed aid in this evaluation, RO4650B, RO3003, CC350, and the RC door 6035. So these are materials that many people will consider for high power applications. The RC door 5080, the reason it is here is that this is a material that is used many times in amplifiers for broadcast, uh, and this usually is in the kilowatt area, so this is something that people in the, U in the past have uh, looked at for very high power. So when we look at this 50 ohm trace under these conditions, we can see that the temperature rise is not just about losses. Uh, the temperature rise also comes in, the, in essence of what happens with the temp, uh, thermal coefficient uh, of, of the conductivity. So uh, the situation we have is that the best material in performance, the RT 5080, uh, it goes up by about 140 degrees C in this model. Compare that to the 4250B, it's very similar, uh, very similar in, in, in temperature, even though the losses are significantly different. When we start looking at materials with higher thermal conductivity and when, with uh, lower losses, you can see the LO3003, the TC350, and the RT 6035 had significantly better performance. Now, some of these materials from a commercial uh, perspective are better choices than others, but this at least gives the engineer the options that they have in trying to manage temperature rise and minimize that while maintaining um, um, uh, good efficiency levels in the power and the fire. The next slide, uh, here we have actually some measure data. Uh, we used uh, passive minimum modulation test equipment uh, that, uh, to look at uh, power levels up to, you know, limited up to 25, 30 watts. Uh, but this data backs up what we saw in the previous slide in model data in that the, uh, the temperature rise for the RT Duro at 5080, so it's a 2.2 delta constant material, and the RO4050B, the thermoset, are fairly similar with each other, uh, while the RT Duro at 6035 is one-third of the value of the other folks, the other materials. Uh, but when you look at the data, uh, also we compare this to FR4 just to give an idea where uh, traditional materials tend to be, you can see that FR4 uh, uh, would not even be close to be considered for these kinds of applications when you can see the temperature rise of this type of material would be four times that of the uh, RT George 5880 or the RO4250B uh, material. Uh, so uh, in addition to that, um, now let's look at what happens when we look at smooth copper and at added benefits uh, to, uh, to manage the temperature rise? So the designers will have the option of using uh, various types of copper coils. We have found that typically uh, um, engineers will look at insertion loss and they know that the use of smooth copper coil is important to that. On the graph here, we have the data that shows the uh, insertion loss of the hour 4350B material compared to smooth copper and the traditional copper that the product uses. The smooth copper is a product that allows low core copper foil, uh, an improvement of about 30% in the insertion loss. But when we look at the really important here is the thermal images uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the traces, we can see that the temperature rise for the uh, smooth copper is almost half that of the um, uh, traditional copper foil. So the bottom, the bottom trace uses low core foil, uh, the bottom image, and you can see 19 degree temperature rise compared to 34C. So this is another option that designers have in selecting the right material configuration is to be using then products that have smooth foil to reduce insertion loss and to also reduce temperature rise due to uh, RF feeding. In addition to that, then we take a look at what happens when all these traces have a surface finish, uh, as will be common in just about any of the RF boards. Uh, typically, when one sees the, the, a signal with bare copper and you will play the electrical signal goal, you can see here some of the traces how they significantly increase in loss uh, due to the effect of nickel uh, being on the edges of the trace and gold on the sides as well. These, both these materials will have higher uh, resistivity than that of copper and will have an effect on the RF performance of the material. So this is something that then we will uh, consider sitting down and, and talking about how to configure the best uh, circuit and for thermal management, and that would be to consider finishes that do not have as high a temperature rise, as would be the case of silver is one of the choices. Uh, but for, uh, 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 let's
let's say manufacturing uh, uh, considerations, sometimes uh, silver is is not always what is best in terms of uh, a high volume of manufacturing for all the population the board. So that's something we still have to work together with the industry to resolve. Another important item that gets asked is uh, managing the team's control of the of these uh, of the many of the lines on the circuit boards. And typically, uh, we will get uh, engineers asking for tightening of the dial to constant of the material. But when you really look at the graph, is that at the parameters that will affect uh, the impedance of a transmission line, whether in the case, you know, here's the equation for micro strip and strip line. When we look specifically to micro strip, we find that a 30 mil uh, material uh, can vary uh, in tolerance by about plus or minus six and a half percent. Edging tolerances typically will be about plus or minus one mil, which is in this case for a 50 amp trace, it would be about plus or minus one and a half percent. While the dollar per constant really will vary by about only plus or minus 1.4 percent. And when you look at the equation itself, you see that the impact of dollar per constant on the is a square root effect versus more of a direct effect uh, for the, uh, the other for width variation as well as thickness variation. So what we found in the graph that you see is that the variation of thickness uh, of the dielectric uh, is, is more critical uh, to overall the impedance control than variation in essence, at least from the, from the materials when it comes to uh, dielectric constants or the line width control. So if in the design one does need to have higher impedance control, uh, then we say that we should then start looking at materials that have a higher thickness tolerance um, uh, around the uh, for, for this, the same uh, uh, property. So thickness control should be first uh, when we consider better impedance control. So in addition to substrates, uh, many times uh, these materials have to be then mounted on some type of a heat sink because the device themselves that are going to be generating power, solid state devices are going to get extremely hot and we need to generally get the heat out. Directly, this will be mounted on a metal, a metal plate of uh, some type, and many times the metal plate gets mounted is, is basically attached to the dielectric or PCB material. Uh, today, one of the most common methods to do so is to do that with a sweat solder approach or requesting material uh, that is already directly bonded onto the metal. Um, another use of heat is uh, adhesive, similarly, and what we conduct with adhesive, of which Rogers has a product called uh, the Cool Span. Uh, and this is a material that is an epoxy film with silver fill that provides very good electrical and mechanical, uh, electrical and, uh, and thermal uh, values so that one can adhere this to the, uh, to the metal sink uh, and in a process that is easier to manage rather than doing a more complex or costly direct bond uh, or, uh, or short solder process. So from a material perspective, concluding basically the section of what it means uh, in the selection of the PCB is that uh, after, uh, we're recommending that one should work such that the maximum operating temperature is below 125 C for long-term reliability. Uh, additional considerations are always important here in addition to the laminate, the substrate, and that is the use of smooth copper and lower metal finishes. And uh, impedance control, uh, what we do is we, you know, how to improve that thickness uh, is, to, is something to be looked at first, followed by dielectric constant uh, tolerance improvements. And with that, I will uh, conclude that conclusive section on the uh, Rogers for the high frequency substrate, and I'll pass that on to uh, Anna. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. My name is uh, Hans Peter Ostergaard of this HP. I'm uh, the business development at Anna. And I would like to talk about power amplifier matching and copper design using single and multi-layer PCB technology. So a little bit about Anna Microwave. Uh, we are an older company, not quite as large, but we are from 1967. Uh, we provide uh, integrated microwave technology to both wireless and space and defense uh, markets. Uh, we are doing around 200 million in sales, where the majority is in our space and defense area and about 35% is in wireless. Now we have about 1,000 employees and four global manufacturing uh, locations. Uh, headquarters is in Syracuse, New York. Nice cold weather up there. Uh, and that's where we do uh, a lot of our FEMA products, as many of you might know, and we also do our microelectronics uh, from uh, MS Kennedy Group, and uh, we do a lot of our space and defense work. <coughs> We also have a ceramic division of the uh, cell in Hampshire where we do a lot of LTCC, uh, fixed cell, and 
very sort of far. Uh, we have a location in Suzhou, China, where we do a lot of uh, high volume uh, resistant uh, ceramic products. And then we have a very advanced PCB, <coughs> PCB manufacturing location in uh, Littleton, Colorado. So the wireless market, which is very similar to the product we, will, uh, we think we'll do in the our energy market, uh, I'll show some examples. Uh, we do a lot of uh, couplers, uh, if it's uh, hybrid couplers, small couplers, balance, work with some power dividers, with many other passive components. We do it in surface mount packages. We have our soft miniature singers, all made out of uh, very thin layers of PCB material. It's not ceramic, it's all uh, PCB. Uh, example here on the on the right side is the uh, one millimeter square balance. Uh, that's maybe 14 physical board layers in a very small package that's less than 0.8 mil, uh, eight millimeter thick. So very thin. We also do very high power, uh, two, three, four hundred watts of, of average power in the high power singer line. Again, it's uh, made out of PCB material, but uh, very high performance material, so we can achieve low loss and high power. Energy. Our high reliability and our energy singers are very similar to our other high power singers uh, with optimization for the particular market. If it's a military radar, if it's an RF energy uh, product for a microwave oven. Along with uh, all of these, a passive product, or at least most of these passive products, we also need a load for termination or an attenuator or an other uh, white ceramic built uh, resistant product uh, used along with these uh, the couplers. So let's look at the specifics for the, for the move, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'll move a little closer to the microphone. Uh, for a specific amplifier, Application. We have a uh, here a picture of a a max power amplifier. It is uh, from one of the roadmaps we released uh, to the from the RF Energy Alliance. Uh, it shows a typical lineup where you have a driver on the far left. Uh, it's impeding map to 50 ohm, and that is driving a high power device. Uh, it also has a pretty large matching network. And the output of this LD box transistor, in this case, is a, again mapped to a 50 ohm line, and then in this case it goes to a connector that might connect to a, a cavity in a microwave oven. If you look at the overall size, and size means uh, money, and of course the smaller you make it, the, the lower cost you can make it. So if you want to reduce the size of this, you have to look at the matching networks, which are very significant size, of the overall, and uh, that's an area you have to swing. You can do it by going to a higher CK uh, value because the, the length gets shorter physically, but then you have power and uh, you have to worry about. So the limiting factor on power handling is typically the output where you have a higher, higher power density and we have the narrow line, a 50 ohm line typically. Uh, so if we have to optimize the power handling, we have to look in, look at can we do something on what material we, we pick or can we do something with impedance we're working with. If you see an example of some power handling numbers, you can see that a Roger 4350 board on a 50 ohm line has a power handling roughly of 280 watts. If you make the same uh, product in a 35 ohm line, you increase the power handling to 445 watts. You can then go to a more expensive material and you can significantly improve the power handling. The other option is if you go to a thicker board, you can go from a 60 mil, in this case, board, where you get 900 watts with this very high performance HCC material. Uh, if you go to a 30 mil, you reduce the power handling. So basically, to improve uh, this product, we have to look at some other uh, ways of doing the matching. If we first go to the low power side, we'll show an alternative. If you use a surface mount component that has, uh, that's using 0805 uh, 
with transformers, you can significantly reduce the size of the matching network. So basically you have 50 ohm to 12.5 ohm and 12.5 ohm to 3 ohm. So this is 08 long and 08 long, so very small uh, matching network. If you go to the high power side, you see that we can put a multi-layer matching network together because in a multi-layer you have many options of running different thicknesses and then you can optimize the total size because you can pick the boards that are ideal for a given team. And of course, when you can laminate layers together, you can also make it in 3D, basically, so you reduce the, the total size. Uh, and the product we made here is uh, about 0.2 degree of insertion loss, and it's quite small uh, compared to the, the printed matching network we showed before. So a significant size reduction that could replace a big section of the output uh, matching network or completely reduce it. Uh, when you combine for a Mackintron replacement, if you want to have like a kilowatt of power, uh, you might have to combine four different uh, transistors as an example. There's many ways of doing that. Uh, you can do it uh, with and without isolation, depending on how well your PA modules are matched. Uh, if they're very well matched, you can get away without uh, any isolation between the stages. So you can use like either hard combining, uh, and you have to work closely with transistor vendors on that, or you can use Wilkinson power dividers without resistor or balance and many other ways. But if you want to avoid the close matching of, of gain, amplitude, and phase, then you, you probably want to have a network that has isolation. That means you could use like a Wilkinson power divider that uses resistors, so you have isolation. Uh, it could be a branch line coupler that can be printed in the layer on PCB also, uh, or a broad type couple, uh, coupler using multi layer PCB. Uh, so there's many options and many more that you can cover here in a, in a few minutes. So let's look at an example. Uh, a typical lineup for a Magnetron replacement uh, product will be a one kilowatt uh, building block where you have four transistors in parallel. They are parallel with the uh, 3D, 90 degree coupler. So uh, you have isolation between the stages. That means any mismatch will be reflected back to the isolated port. So on the input, there will be no reflection, be very good match. Uh, same on the output, you combine any kind of imbalance between the stages. It will basically combine on the different port, on the isolated port, and the power will go out to the final uh, 3D combiner and go to the final output. Then you can build 10 of these if you want a 10 kilowatt system or 100 of these if you want a 100 kilowatt system. That means typically in those cases, you'll have the output go to a, a, a wave-like circulator. But it's very important here that you have good isolation and you have good amplitude balance of the, of the couplers so you don't drive one transistor much harder than the other and thereby reduce the efficiency. And of course, insertion loss, uh, many other variables are, are critical. On the output of the PA, you have to look at, as Klaus mentioned earlier, control is a very important part of these solid state systems. So it's very important that have very good measurement of forward and reverse power. And, and what you can do there is the best measurement you're going to get is with a well matched system and with high directivity on the coupler. So a system where you are running into a circulator, you get very accurate forward power detection and you get very accurate reverse detection because all the reflection goes to the, the terminating uh, attenuator. The second best alternative is using a, a coupler on one side to do forward power detection and another coupler on the on the physical other side of the main line going through. You also get very accurate detection on the reverse because in this case you have very good isolation. Of course, in some of these cooking environments, you have high mismatch, and you don't have one of the critical conditions, which is a good match system. Now you have to optimize the directivity of the coupler, which means the isolation of the coupler, to get the most accurate reading. So there's a trade-off to be made on how you develop this 
forward and reverse power sampling. And some people might also use a single coupler where you do forward and reverse in one, uh, in one component. Uh, an example of a, a high directivity directional coupler, and remember uh, in a cavity and a microwave oven, you might get full reflection in the case of somebody putting a metal object or when the popcorn is done cooking, you might start getting very high uh, reflection. So if I have a 300 watt output of a PA and I send it all into the cavity, I might have 300 watts or close to it coming back. So I really need a 600 watt coupler. Because of the limitations with PCBs and getting the heat out of these uh, devices, uh, we have come up with a new approach where we actually put a main, the main 50 ohm line is kept on the microstrip board itself, and then we put a component on top that has a main line on the bottom, and then inside, in other layers, we print the, the copper itself. So this is a very high power way of getting uh, the performance you need, very high isolation or directivity of the coupler, and you also get very repeatable results. But this only works because of the very accurate uh, uh, etching we can do with, with our PCB technology. Without the tight tolerances on etching and all the material, uh, this will not be accurate. So in summary, uh, there's a lot of uh, applications for this RF energy uh, market. Uh, due to the high reflected low conditions, we see many of these. Uh, we really need to be careful with output circuitry because power hanging has to be very high uh, to meet the requirements. Uh, we have tried to develop some new products that try to solve some of these issues and problems, and hopefully this can help uh, get us to the cost target uh, we're trying to get for these high volume applications. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Hugo Sooner. Thank you, HP. Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hannes Grobinger. I'm with Huber and Zuna, working in the RF division uh, corporately. Also, from my side, a couple of words to the company. Huber and Zuna is a company that's dating back to 1864, where the company Suna was founded, and uh, 1882, where the company Huber was founded, which both merged in 1969 into Huber and Suna. There's a couple of uh, recent milestones and changes. Uh, for example, 2012, company Astrolab has been acquired, and Astrolab today is Huber Suna's center of excellence for space flight. There is a opening of production center in China, and there's a position of tube optics, which is uh, more important for the fiber optic side. In terms of products, Kuban Tuna does cables, connectors, components, assemblies, and systems in three different technologies, which are radio, fre radio frequency, fiber optics, and low frequency. When we talk when we talk further, we talk mainly about radio frequency products for this, uh, for this microwave oven and our energy business. You may ask why connectivity and connectors comes up as a topic for microwave oven, uh, and you may ask, or you may come to the point that there is already solutions in today's microwave oven. The reason and the answer to this question is quite simple, since the magnetron, as used in today's oven, couples more or less directly into a rectangular waveguide. So the state is amplifiers mainly built on PCBs, as Art explained before, and PCBs need a different connectivity as magnetrons need. If you look to the current, current generation, this is uh, according to our Energy Alliance roadmap generation zero and one, cables are used. HP showed a picture before where a large connector has been uh, mounted on the edge of this amplifier module, 
and this is simply connected to the cutting cavity by the means of cables and connectors. There is a second cable, which, uh, second connector, which is used for coupling into the waste guide or directly into the cooking cavity. Connectors and cables, however, need a, a selection, and the selection will mainly be dependent on power handling. There is a 250 watts per channel set as a target. This can be covered by any connectors. This can be covered by other connectors with higher power levels, such as 4310 and 716. There might also be the discussion of using threaded or non-threaded uh, connectors. This is an issue when the assembling, since uh, non-threaded connectors do not need uh, defined torque, and when it comes to shock and vibration, they do not need to be secured. A couple of words to cabling. Of course, all the power handling for cabling is a very important factor. And when it comes to cable, temperature is one of the major limitations. A cable which allows transmitting 600 watts of power at room temperature may only allow transmitting 50 watts of power at 150 degrees Celsius. And this, of course, the temperatures have been set and defined by the open manufacturers, but we agree that close to the cooking cavity, we will have temperatures higher than room temperature. Cable losses, of course, and, and a further issue, uh, which are mainly defined by thickness, length, and material. And all that has a significant impact on performance and price. And unfortunately, it is the better the performance, the higher the price. One solution to move forward, to move into RVA power amplifier generation three and four could be to just eliminate the cables. This would mean having a connector which connects on the one hand side to the PCB, on the other hand side into the cooking cavity. It still would be something like a coaxial mode, uh, and it would be performance-wise a good solution. One issue, however, is the, that it is a very mechanically rigid system. There is no mechanical freedom. And that's why probably a solution similar to, to, to board to board connectors is something very feasible for, for the next generation. This allows a certain mechanical freedom, which in detail is the actual float, which is compensating misalignment, and which also brings the, the elimination of the cable. There is different versions. It can be an edge mount or it can be a top mount, and it may even allow mounting boards via panel-to-panel -panel or board-to-board through panel solution. This gives a very high flexibility for such a system. Looking at this more into details, for assembling the open, it, it provides blind makeability. It, provides radial and actual tolerances, uh, meaning that assembly will have high performance at relative low price. Parts are available as separated parts, as pre-assembled parts. Also, this uh, has additional features for a cheap assembly process, and at the same time, as mentioned before, it has excellent insertion and return loss. It provides excellent shielding, and it uh, has high enough output power levels. A couple of additional words to the power levels. When we take into account MBX type, which is one type which is used in high volume in communication industry, uh, we, it is used today for 260 watts at room temperatures which, however, also drops when we go to higher temperatures. 
This means that for this specific market using microwave ovens, the board-to-board -board connector has to go through further optimization. Optimization in respect to power, in respect to performance, cost, and temperature. One further solution is one further solution is integrating the board to board connector in the housing, which could be the housing of the power amplifier module. As example sh shown here is a filter to board solution, which in the next step could also be a board to cavity solution. Cavity in this case is the cooking cavity of the microwave oven. In talking a bit about more details, this means connectors would be integrated into a customer housing. Uh, it would be highly integrated and therefore allows for further cost reduction. This, this is basically possible with any housing, any housing which provides a metallic background, of course. This would be a solution for generation three up to four, but we believe that there will be additional and new concepts we will come up. For example, replacing the whole transmission path, which in all the previously shown concepts is made by a coaxial mode by an alternative feeding structure. This would allow direct coupling from a PCB into the cooking cavity, this, this would reduce the number of mode conversions. This would also allow for a very adaptable manufacturing process, uh, dropping costs at high volume. Advantages would be similar to those of the board to board connectors, low losses, robustness, and of course, fulfilling the reliability target of the oven manufacturing. This already leads me uh, to the very last slide of this presentation, and I hand back to Klaus Werner, who will get the conclusion uh, over this webinar. Anders, thank you very much. The, we didn't dwell too much on the actual applications, really, but uh, they are extremely beautiful, and a lot of them are out there. And you need to trust me on that hand a little bit. But I, my belief, and certainly also the belief of the members of the Alliance, is that this technology will have a brilliant future. We will also see completely new applications. The Magnetron, as such, is a great energy source, but it cannot. It misses. Uh, it lacks the number. It lacks the control that you need to drive more complicated stuff. And again, we may have a chance to talk about this further in another webinar, but uh, not today. On the other hand, you have seen today a lot of critical uh, technologies that go in there. You have seen that the members are investing diligently into uh, the manufacturing base, into the technology. So my belief, and we have a lot of quick points for that, is I target that we need to meet to make the consumer applications actually come true are not at all out of reach. We see them really closing in. Um, so, as I said, again, the member companies are diligently investing into enabling these technologies, uh, active and passive components, as we've heard about today, and technologies, but also in assembly, manufacturing base, and things like that. What uh, we will see in markets uh, and uh, adoption outlook is that the industrial and professional users will be the first ones to adopt the technology, also on a larger scale, within this year. I actually expect a number of announcements uh, very quickly. You may have seen a couple of other announcements for smaller units, for, for handheld and mobile um, microwave cooking devices, but they still haven't hit the market in, in large volumes but there will be professionals and industrial users that really go into production and make these technology available in the marketplaces. And certainly the subsequent years will see this uh, technology trickling down from the high end into more consumer-oriented applications. 
And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and your interest in the organization and the technologies and hand over to Patrick, I believe, for the questions and possible answers. Yes, thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, very good presentation, a good team effort. So we uh, open up the Q&A session. If you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A box and leave the default setting to all participants. And let's begin with the uh, first question. Uh, this is for Anarin. What is the difference in insertion loss between the printed and the Zinger impedance matching of a PA? So the example I showed, uh, we have the Zinger version is about 0.2 of uh, 0.2 degree of insertion loss over temperature, and the printed is a little bit more on that, it's about 0.25. So I get a little bit of an improvement. Uh, but this is comparing to something on a Rogers 4350 board, and we use it on quite advanced, so it kind of makes sense because we're also able to reduce the, the size of it. So a little bit of an improvement. Okay, this question is for Klaus with the RF Energy Alliance. How do you handle competitors around the table when they're discussing the various technologies? All right, that's a good one, of course. Yeah, that's a, that's a concern that a lot of companies have when they join us. At the, the point, though, is that we adhere, we have some IPR policy, so we have IPR ground rules that everybody needs to adhere to. And basically, um, we have also a RAND policy, so if somebody puts an IP that can be used by anybody else within the organization, there is uh, the, uh, the notion that it needs to be at reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. So, um, and there's even a choice of putting no IP at all into the organization. So that, that really depends, but it's basically at the discretion of the member to join. The moment that you are working with in a technical community and, for instance, devising a standard for, what do I know, maybe a connector, like Hannes described, then um, it, you would need to make yourself known as having IP in that area and whether you want to bring it in or not. But uh, if you don't want to bring it in, the team at least has a chance to work around that kind of critical IP. Other than that, basically all the information shared within the alliance is free, is, uh, is known and confidential. Great. Uh, next question is for Rogers. What other factors could affect impedance of a trace on a high-frequency PCB material? Uh, thank you, Pat. Um, yeah, good question. And again, in the limited time we had, um, couldn't cover all areas. But uh, one also needs to take into account when selecting material is how these materials are affected by temperature, for example. Uh, some materials may have a significant change in value to constant versus temperature. Uh, so obviously exposing the material that's are operating at this are operating at high temperature, if you designed it and, and optimized it and you were in the laboratory and you use the values of value to constant that are given at room temperature, but you're oper uh, operating at 100 and 125, that's another area that, that is important to take note because you may find that the change in the constant in some materials could be as high as one or two percent from room temperature to 100 and 125. So that's another area that one needs to take into account if you're trying to uh, have the most stable, uh, basically, in P line, is to take into account environmental effects. And then there's also the area of uh, humidity, but in and being that these are going to be found in areas of uh, in, in home, not so much, but you know, you are cooking something uh, and uh, that is uh, obviously with the high humid content and can some of that humidity leak into the area of the amplifier, then that's, that's something that might be of concern. But typically, temperature is obviously the part that you would need to be mainly worried about and the stability of your cost. Great. And the next question is for Huber and Schooner. Uh, what, why is it not feasible to use standard cables and connectors? I think you kind of covered it, but maybe if you could summarize. Well, it's mainly three factors. It's price, power, and temperature. Power and temperature go kind of together, and, of course, we have to find a price level which is acceptable for the industry. It will not be price level of a high-end 60 gigahertz connector at the end. Okay, and next question, maybe Klaus would be the best one to handle this. Uh, does GAN have a future in solid state microwave oven? I think we do have planned a future webinar discussing uh, the actual power amplifier technologies themselves. That, that's true. I mean, there, there, there will be 
uh, one or two at least? Well, the, the very brief answer is uh, it depends. The, if you need the high performance, ruggedness, very high efficiency, broadbandedness for a microwave oven that you need to build, then, yeah, then you should look at gallium nitride. There's also recently, as you're probably aware of, Macon has announced gallium nitride on silicon. They still need to get uh, the manufacturing base in order to, to have then possibly a chance to meet an LDMOS kind of price levels. <clears throat> if this is true, then there's definitely uh, a uh, proposition there. Other than that, I believe that for the low end, say high or say high volume consumer type of market, I would think that LDMOS is currently still uh, the, the more economic um, proposition. Okay, and probably another question for you, and um, maybe everyone else can chime in if they want, is what is the weight difference between solid state PAs and the current magnetron technology? The weight difference? Is that for the, did I understand that correctly? Correct. Um, that's a good question. I would think if you look at current PAs, they're mostly built from milled aluminum boxes, so these can be actually pretty heavy, even, if it's, even though it's aluminum. Uh, I have seen technologies that will make uh, the aluminum boxes all but vanish, uh, and that will be then also very light. So in the end, I believe um, there might be a slight advantage to the magnetron, although if you count in the transformer of the magnetron, it's, uh, it's already losing hands down against solid state, because the transformer, at least the ones that I carried around here a couple of times, are pretty heavy things, and solid state is not like that, certainly not in the next generation. It will be pretty light things. Okay, next question is back to Anarin. How much power does the Zinger 40 dB handle with high reflective power from the load? Uh, I think uh, I mentioned a little bit about that. Uh, it's designed to handle the 300 watt uh, forward, as you saw in the PA example, and, and that's the main building blocks we're working with in the Alliance at the moment. Uh, so 300 watt forward and full reflection back, so 600 watt total power. And uh, the power, uh, the power hand requirements is, is quite bad uh, or high. Uh, because the power you might see on localized uh, level is the peak can be much higher than than just the, the forward and the reverse uh, combined. It can actually be quite a bit higher locally. So it's designed to handle the uh, 300 watt out and 300 watt reflected. Great. And next question for Rogers. What can you say about the reliability of the materials when exposed to high temperatures during processing or in the field? Thank you, Pat. Um, yeah, so I guess what, one of the things that, that is important is obviously the overall reliability um, on materials. And you can say there's two levels of reliability. We have some products that have been designed and with very high uh, uh, requirements to support the airspace and defense. And then we have the ones that we call commercial, but still high reliability, but have a different standard. Uh, and, and what we're seeing so far in the applications here, and as Klaus commented, uh, we have uh, some ovens that will be going operating for hours at a time for more industrial, and then you'll have the ones that are for uh, commercial that will be for a home uh, consumer, which will be on maybe for half an hour during the day. So depending on what which ones you're designing with, you would go with some materials that have very high end. But in general, these electrics have uh, low uh, coefficient expansion uh, uh, values, which means for high reliability when exposed to high temperatures during Prusato refill processing and for in the field. So in general, the, the materials that, that have low Z-axis expansions would be the ones we recommend. With, I showed in the RT Dura 1580 that the broadcast people use, that wouldn't be one that we necessarily would recommend because of the higher uh, Z-axis expansion. Uh, but that was just used as an example and compared the RF performance versus thermal. Okay, next question for Huber and Schooner. Uh, what's the temperature limitations for connectors and cables of the type that you recommend? Yes, thank you. Well, the main temperature limitation comes from the dielectric material, and this is different to what we had had in the past in the rectangular waveguide, which is metal only. 
and limitations, I would say, is some, somewhere around 250 degrees field Celsius. If the customer requires halogen-free materials, the limit will be lower. Okay, great. I think we've uh, exhausted the questions here and run uh, against our timeline here. I'd like to thank the team from Mandarin, Fuller and Schooner, the RF Energy Alliance, and Rogers Corporation. Please visit their website for more information. This webinar has been recorded and will be available for to viewing in the events section of the MicroJournal website in about 24 hours. All those who registered will receive an email with a link to download a copy of today's slides. And we thank everybody for joining us today and hope to see you on future RF Energy Alliance webinars.